Thank you for being here. Can you hear me okay? Yes? The lights are a little strong, so I can't see you very well. All right. <clears throat> it's feeling good? Enjoying it so far? Okay. So, um, my name is Stephanie. I am obviously going to talk a little bit about user experience today, but mostly what I'd like to share with you, sort of, you know, huge contrast to what Christian was nerding you out with, um, <laughs> we, we're going to look at the context of creating a product, and this could be anything from a mobile app, a, a website, a digital, oh, we're talking about apps. We talk about um, content-driven sites. Hopefully, this kind of process is that little bit before you decide what to do. <clears throat> so, just a little bit about me and who you're spending some time with for the next 45 minutes before you get too bored of me. I'm a user experience strategist. I'm a consultant for MailChimp, um, also a designer. But also, I'm the editor-in-chief of WebStandard Sherpa. We are an online magazine where we receive user-submitted sites, and we review them from a best practices perspective. And we have a few Sherpas in the audience today, which is really awesome. Hey! <laughs> um, in my not so very much spare time, I'm a silversmith and a jewelry artist. And occasionally, I try to be the improvisation musician. Before I go too far, I want to you know, please excuse my very funny accent. And you probably noticed that I'll start with one and end with the other. I lived in four different continents and, uh, and four different islands, actually, for that matter. And uh, I, will, I might have a tendency to speak too fast if I'm excited. So please tell me to slow down, like, especially the ones I can see here, if I'm speaking too fast. Um, yeah, let's keep move on. So I want to know, who are you? So I've asked them to turn the house lights up a little bit so I can see a show of hands. I want to know who designs in this audience. That's a fair number. Very, very awesome. So I presume that you're graphic design as well as interaction design. I see some nods. OK, great. Who writes code? Brilliant. OK, the designers are outnumbered. I'm sorry. <laughs> who, who, um, who leads a team or manages a product or a project? OK, that's about the right sort of uh, number. Who um, delivers strategy? Any strategies? OK, so little pockets of people sort of like this. <laughs> OK, now, who has raised their hands more than once? Have a look around. See how many of you you are that do more than one thing. I think this is really amazing. OK, two more questions. Who has created a product from scratch, like from the idea to the thing? OK, fewer, but pretty good. Who has, who is doing a startup or is thinking of doing one? That's also quite a lot. I can't really see the people in the back. It's a bit tough for me. OK, awesome. Thank you very much. So. What is user experience? I hear the lot, you see. Um, this is a, a tweet from Andy Bud about two weeks ago, where it seems that a room full of designers have difficulty defining what user experience is. And that's quite normal, because it's a really complex task. And I say, let's avoid that question, because it's not important. What is more important is where user experience can take us, and what the tools we have in terms of the process, and what we can end up with. How do we end up with a unique, great product? And I think you can all agree with me in this room that that's something that we probably care about, and that's why we're here, right? <clears throat> Has anyone seen this diagram before? OK. That's not surprising, but that's OK. <laughs> um, I've seen, so we've got three circles here, business, user, and technology. And the idea is in the middle somewhere, you get some kind of digital product where you expect the technology to support the business needs and user requirements. This gives you a kind of an idea. However, I think there's a much better de definition of what makes a great product. And that is when you take brand into account. And with brand, I don't mean a logo. I mean something like a personality or a voice. And there are people in this audience who are better be able to express this much better than I can. Um, it's about being exotic or fun or adventurous. Or you can be a brand that is serious, useful, or reliable. And somewhere in there where your brand supports your business needs and where your user requirements are is where you are very likely to find a unique product. 
I'm not going to get to talk about brand today because that's an entire different conversation, but where I want to go to is talk about the kinds of tools you can use in user experience to get you to that little bit in the middle that is unique. <clears throat> um, I apologize for these garish colors because this is not my infographic. Um, this came out in Mashable about two and a half weeks ago now, and it's called Nine Steps for Creative Problem Solving by Ronald Brown. Uh, this would probably have worked much better on the magazine than on screen. So what I'm going to do is walk you through it really quickly, because I'd like to give us some context about what the rest of this talk is about. So identify is the first thing you do. You figure out what the pain points are, what is it the problem you're trying to solve, and then you spend some time gathering and examining information all around it. So typically, for example, if you happen to be doing um, I'm, well, I'm sure you can think of your own example, but for me, if you're trying to create a, a startup or a digital solution to digital publishing, you want to be understand currently what publishers are doing, what writers are doing, how do they communicate with publishers and agents and the entire process around it. When you have your information back, uh, sorry, when you have your information back, the theory is, according to this infographic, that you incubate, basically you sit on the idea, and wait for something to hatch. I have a slight issue and disagreement with these particular two circles, and I'll explain later why. Um, but, you know, the idea that you sit on it like a hen on an egg, and then something hatches later that you can help you run your business is kind of a little far-fetched. Um, anyway, throughout the process, from then on, you find, uh, find something in all the things that you've discovered that differentiates you from your competitors, and the last three little circles, unfortunately for the project managers, this is where you sort of fit. <laughs> um, you plan, you execute, and you track, and we keep going again. So just very quickly, in terms of a more meta view of the process, you find the problem you want to solve, and the next three little bubbles, circles here, help you shape the problem that you're trying to solve. You make a decision about what you're solving, and then you start to think about how to implement it and then track it and assess whether you're doing it correctly. So that's a very, very high sort of level overview of what a big sort of creative process is like. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually two halves to this circle. The first half is really the problem space. This is where you look at what problem you're trying to solve and how you get to it, and really the rest of it is solution space. I'm going to spend more time um, in the problem space today. And why is that? So, does anyone know this book? I'm not sure it's translated in anything other than English right now. It's called The Myths of Innovation by Scott Birkin. Has anyone read it? It's kind of a two, two three hands. If you, are, if you are into starting something from scratch, please read this book. Uh, I wish I did it. <laughs> I wish I read the book before I started my own startup a few years ago. So he says, the great mistake is leaping from facts to solutions, skipping over the play and exploration at the heart of finding new ideas. I would actually go further to say it is harder to find the right facts without taking the time to verify that the facts you've got at your, in your hand are actually the facts that you need. Back to a little problem cycle here. Um, I've sort of rearranged it, and you see, how do we map this to user experience? You can be intentional with creativity and intentional with how you come up with your ideas. So the identify would match with anyone, uh, well, anyone know the design thinking sort of framework of things? Okay, one or two. It's a very academic term, but it more or less maps onto this. So problem definition, maps onto your identifier part of the process, and you can imagine using user research or market research or any other means that you can think of in these two other bubbles where you find more information. And also, many, I, many, many processes that have been well documented in user experience about sketching and prototyping in incubating and retrieving. So here, it is possible for us to use these sketching tools that we've been using to, to generate solutions, but actually explore the problem space. However, today, because we only have a few <laughs> short amount of time, I'm particularly going to focus on the naming and reframing um, area of this process. And there are other tools I wish I have time to talk about. So for example, how you could um, use, how you can translate what you find in research 
into, uh, sorry, how can you frame your research, and then how we can translate the results from research into generating ideas. There's plenty of stuff in that, so if you're interested in talking about it, feel free to catch me afterwards. But today we're mostly going to focus on the naming and framing. And also, I'm going to go through a series of tools, and that could be a little bit tough for, well, 11 something in the morning. Um, some of them I'll go through in more detail than others, mostly because there are other things that you can find out about them online. I will just mention them, and feel free to go look them up later on. So, a problem well defined is a problem half solved. And the problem is, it's actually very easy to solve the wrong problem. I want to ask who has built a Facebook clone or has been asked to build a Facebook clone? No, I hear murmurs. So one, two. Okay. Now, that's an idea, I mean, that's a, excuse me, that is an example of a valley, badly brain problem. If you are starting your problem with a solution, you're probably not thinking about the right thing. To illustrate a well-framed problem, do you know who invented the light bulb? Who invented the light bulb? I hear Edison. Who thinks Edison? Okay, can I, someone do tell me another name? Steve Jobs? <laughs> okay. So the, the question also is, what does invention mean, right? If you want to think as far back as who figured out that you can roll up bits of wax and then stick a wick in it and light it, the idea of a singular light as, as separated from other things have existed for a very, very long time. And if that was a predecessor to the light bulb, we've forgotten who invented the light bulb. Um, there are two other documented names that have invented the light bulb amongst many, and they include Humphrey Davy, and um, Joseph Swan, whom we have no idea about, like we don't know very much about them, but we remember Edison. The reason is, Edison is the first person who figured out that his problem was not about selling light bulbs or making the best light bulb. Edison figured out that the, the problem he had to solve was to how to get electricity to every single house so that they will buy a light bulb. And that's basically how he made his fortune. And you can see the impact when you look at the problem in a different way, what kind of impact you would have. So, what is it the problem that we are solving? What is it the impact we want to have with what we're doing? And how do we measure success? Really, really difficult questions. Um, not even then, the moment you throw people into account, you know, what are the organizational constraints that we have? What are the business goals that we have and the vision that we need to sort of satisfy to make everyone else happy, especially the ones with the money? <clears throat> there, um, the tool is very simple, and I think we don't think about it enough. Um, stakeholders generally mean, uh, so if, you are in, if you're in a company, they could be your boss, their boss, whoever's actually, who, whoever, would, have a, would feel the impact if the project succeeds or fail. So if you're running a small team yourself, your stakeholder could be your co-founders, your team, and so it would really vary. So I say interviews, but probably it should be conversations. Now, who's been in sort of that situation where you're in the meeting room, and three hours later, you haven't figured out where you've gotten out of? Yay. <laughs> I think everyone. Now, there are plenty of ways to make meetings more efficient, but there are some tools in user experience that can help you figure out how to nail the problem, especially those kinds of questions I was pointing out earlier. Who has seen the SWOT and SPOT tool before? Okay, mostly I can, the project managers and the strategists in the room have seen this. So for everyone else, uh, so you go to sleep for like 30 seconds. Um, for everyone else, it's a very, very simple thinking tool, and it's a traditional strate strategy tool um, that is in use in combination with other things. But it is useful in a sort of a design context because what you do is you put all your strengths on one qu top quadrant, and your problems are weaknesses and opportunities and threats. The only thing you have to sort of make sure is the internal factors are on the same side, and the external factors, the opportunities and threats, are on the different, on the sort of bottom quadrant. And you can flip it any way you want, it doesn't really matter. Um, generally, I found that people respond better to the word problems than weakness, so it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and also, I've also found that people would tend to, if you have a very negative, I don't know, client or people you're working with, you have a huge list of problems and not very much strengths. And we have to figure out how to balance that sort of thing. <clears throat> 
the idea here is how do you th how do you convert problems into strengths? How do you convert threats into opportunities? And it's a thinking tool. Sit down and sort of like figure out: Is there something we can do? And use this sort of grid to help guide your discussion because. What you can do then following that is to match your strengths to your opportunities. And this is where you will figure out whether you have potential objectives or not. Bear in mind that this is a starting point. This is not something that you end up with. You don't decide at this point. It's to, to lay out the lens so you know what you're thinking about. Now, I can talk about this all I want, but what's the best thing for you to do is actually to try it out with your next project and figure out if that helps you or not. It only comes with practice. So, moving on. The question with brand. Now, I promise I wasn't going to talk a lot about brand, but there will be something in here that is important. What are core values, and who do we want to be when we grow up? If you're a product, you're starting from maybe your first few little bits of functionality. How do you move on? What values do you represent? There is a tool for that. This is going to be the new app. <laughs> um, so again, really, really simple idea. Draw two lines. Label them. Label emotional or rational. And start thinking about what makes what you're doing special. Wh how would you describe it to somebody else? How would you want someone else to talk about it? So this list is uh, from a project. This is, this is from a project that I worked with. Um, unfortunately, it's no longer online. It was an online game where the goal was to show people um, ways to look at the world differently. So you send people out on missions to take photographs of things they've never done before, or you get people to do a good deed. Um, and so we sat down and thought about it. So let me read it out to you, just in case you can't read it well. Um, on the emotional side, sort of emotional adjectives, words, fun, psychic, psychic because you, the app just figures out what you want. Motivating, entertaining, magical, encouraging, surprising, allowing me to influence and to inspire. And the rational stuff is kind of almost a little boring in comparison. Effective and effective. So in English, you've got these two words. One, to be effective means to be efficient. Uh-oh, that wasn't very effective. Um, <laughs> Are you okay there? It's good, nothing broken? Okay. Um, to affect is to be able to make a change, to incite change. And so this is sort of like more functional stuff of, uh, of the particular app. Now, we've got this list, and then we look at our homepage at the time. So I'm afraid I can't show you because they shut down the site back in August this year. Um, we had, so you've seen some startup homepages where it says, this is the benefits of signing up, one, two, three. You can do this. It's free. Um, what we found was that homepage wasn't working for a very good reason, because all the values of this particular startup were emotional. And if you start breaking stuff, things like, here's what the benefits are, one, two, three, you're appealing to the rational side of the brain. So we changed our homepage, and we immediately saw results by appealing to the more adventurous side of people and getting them to try something new. So this is a really, really important tool and very simple one for a couple of reasons, and I'm just going to take a time to say that. Um, if you look at the power of these words, they have, they're the beginnings of your art direction. They're the beginnings of your creative direction. They can tell you what keywords probably need to appear in your copy. They can tell you when someone comes to ask you for help, this function isn't working, what is the kind of personality you need to take when you communicate with them. And it helps you with your content strategy. So something as simple as this can have major impact in helping you angle what your voice is online. Who, won, who likes competitors? So what are they doing and how are we different to them? I'm not going to have much time to talk about this, but have a look it up if you haven't done a competitive an analysis before. Now, a competitive analysis is not one of those comparison charts where you've got a number of ticks. That is not a competitive analysis. What you want to be doing is understanding what your competitors are doing from a brand perspective. What, is it they're, well, what are their values? What adjectives do they attach to themselves? How well they deliver on it? Who their user base is? What is their business model? And then, finally, feature sets. Okay? So I'm not going to, unfortunately, spend much time talking about it, but there are, there are resources online that you can look at. Build it and they will come. How am I doing for time? Is somebody keeping time for me? <laughs> no? Okay. 
So, oh well, okay, well you have me for all day. Um, <laughs> build it and they will come. Who's heard this phrase before? Okay, two, three. I don't know, is there a German equivalent or you, uh, a French equivalent? No? Um, maybe it's all the, the, the English will believe this. <laughs> um, okay, who actually believes it? Okay. So, the problem with this particular short sentence is the depth of information that comes with, with it. Who are they? Who are these people? How will they find out about you? And uh, why do they need what you're building? Why would they choose you over competition? I have 10 minutes? Okay. That's all right. So, really, I have 10 minutes? Okay. Um, ooh, all right then. <laughs> so, let's, let me tell you about the run collector as an illustration. Someone tell me when I have five minutes left, please. Um, let me tell you about the run collector. So, this is another tool. <clears throat> that illustrates the user matrices very well. And it's a project that I was doing when I was uh, uh, training a team. And someone, they're all runners, they do sportswear, and they came to me and said, wouldn't it be really cool if we had this app where every city you go to, you can find out where to run? And so we said, okay, well, let's try it out and see who would actually use it. And so what we did was, we figured out what kind of people runners could be. Are they curious runners, engaged runners? Are they social, individual runners? Do they frequently run, or do they run occasionally? Do they run to explore, or they run to compete? We figured out all these little keywords, um, and then we established them as our axes. And then we did this, a three by three. I've done a four by four, it doesn't work so well for whatever reason, I found three by threes work best. And then you choose two key important points, and identify the question you're really asking the matrix. So it's kind of like the magic eight ball thing that you got. Um, what do they need, what do they want, and what can they do? What can they do? Um, so then you start, so here we have the local visitor axis and the explore compete axis. <laughs> yeah, actually stalking other runners to figure out how fast they are is important. You want to know how else everyone is doing if they're competitive. And you keep, keep filling it in, um, and then we sort of defined what the middle part actually is. So somebody who knows the city fairly well but don't go very often and what they would do. Um, and then, when you run out of things to fill in, or when your things look too similar across columns, change the axis and change your questions, rinse and repeat. And so, we did something like four or five of this within about an hour and a bit. You can go very, very fast. Now, bear in mind that this is not research. This is not a true picture. But sometimes, if you're an established company, you already have some research. And something like this can tell and inform you how much you already know about users and how much you don't. Unfortunately, most sort of market research tells you you're between 24 and 35, and you have X amount of money in your bank account, and you have two, kid, two and a half kids. This sort of stuff helps you understand motivation and think through it before you frame your research. And after about sort of, you know, an hour and a bit, we understood our key value proposition, which is we need to answer the question, I wish I knew where to run. And it doesn't matter which group of people we're addressing, that would be the main question. So, but what was most valuable about this exercise we did with this particular app? Um, we realized that the people we need to target first were the local users. Even though the original idea is where I can find to run, the first user base that will be most helpful to the business of this app is the people who know the land enough to upload the, the tracks to run. And so, the first feature set we know we would have to design have to appeal to the local users and they have to find it interesting. So, in summary, these tools uncover your underlying assumptions. They help you understand motivation, behavior, that you already have intrinsically in your team. It's also really good to get everybody in your team to, um, to agree on what this means to each other. It also helps you exp uh, establish some hypotheses, let's try again, hypotheses <laughs> for research, because you don't want to just go, if you want to research, you can find out anything you want, right? But if you have come with hypotheses, you at least know where you're starting from and where you may go wrong. So, moving on. I'm going to very quickly mention design principles, but again, this is also something you can find online. Um, design principles are basically a set of statements that can apply to a page or a product, and they're like design goals that you want to have. So, you can do this sort of in two places. You can do this at this point, or after you've done some user research to help you synthesize the idea. So, <clears throat> 
generally they're written in such a way where you have a statement. So I'm going to read you one, just one. So this is a site that uh, is a very, very family-friendly grocer in San Francisco that also uh, runs a charity to teach people how to eat well and be healthy. So communication, communicate a passion for good food is a very important thing that every single page on the site needs to have. And we say we want to inspire people to eat and cook and bring them the, and producers closer together. So uh, this is one, one way you can sort of synthesize everything that you figured out from before, from the user matrices and also from, um, from sort of your value, uh, rational, emotional grid. Moving on. A sound strategy. A sound strategy is informed by research. But you also have to start somewhere. You have to start from yourself because it's, the product comes from you. I'm going to, so when you do research, there are a couple, of, there's a range of tools here at our disposal. And they sort of more or less fall along this axis of being more open-ended or close-ended. By that I mean whether they'll give you answers that are very, have a tight frame, or whether they'll give you answers that are broader and that allow you to explore. And the open-ended sort of um, techniques, like contextual inquiry and interviews, are the sort of stuff that will help you explore the problem space, whereas, quite rightly, things like heuristic evaluation, sort of expert reviews, or remote testing tools, or usability testing as we know it, where you sit in front of a computer and, get, uh, and record uh, usability, um, and personas, actually, even, they tend to be on the more close-ended side. So, when you choose a research method, understand which one it is that will serve your purpose well. The, our design tools are at our disposal. So when you remember, like, few, quite a few slides back between the incubate and retrieve circle where we talk about um, generating ideas, the ones that are low fidelity generally obviously works for us for, for idea generation, so they're problem-based friendly. So don't worry about trying to write this down. This is online. <laughs> That's a lot of it. And here's where we are. We have a set of tools, and these are not all of it. Um, these tools, uh, sorry, these tools are, are able to help us sort of gear, understand the relationship between business and brand, and the relationship between business and user, the relationship between brand and user. These are only some of them, because there are others, and because I only have a short amount of time with you today. But if you take the time to, to try them out, it's where they'll help you get you unique, get your product to be more unique. And also, it's probably important to understand that this is not going to help you with your genius moment. It's not going to make you a lot of money, I'm sorry. But what it does is it will give you the frame, sort of like the, the outer parameters of the problem you're trying to solve, so that when you go and incubate and generate ideas on what you actually want to do, you have a higher chance of meeting business needs user requirements, and still have a personality in place that is not all over the map. Did I just squish all that in five minutes? Like, I don't see anybody waving. <laughs> okay, how are you doing so far? Doing good? Well, we're almost there. Don't be afraid to experiment. Now, the problem is, it's very easy to think, I mean, it's very easy to think that we all want to do the right thing and want to do our best, and that somehow generally sets us back. With tools like these, it will work differently for different teams. It will work differently for different types of projects. Pull them out of your pocket when you need them. Be brave to try them, and don't be afraid if they don't work. If they don't work, just switch to another one. There is an amazing amount of thinking tools out there, and I keep digging up and finding out more. Some of them just look like children of the other ones. And, uh, and again, they're just variation of tools. For example, if you look up in a book for the sort of user modeling stuff I was talking about, generally you will find the question people ask, like, who are our users? But I found that personally, in my experience with using these tools, it's more interesting to talk about uh, user needs and motivation. So be brave. Don't be afraid to experiment. And also, there are many right answers. Do I have time to tell a story, Mark? OK. Uh, um, I have a friend. I have, well, I have many friends, but I have a friend. <laughs> I have a friend who is a, um, a CFO, so if you, those of you in startups will know what that means. Basically, he has this amazing work of helping startups raise funds, and he's very, very good at it. And um, I see him maybe like, you know, he, we used to work together, but then I'll catch him for coffee every now and again. And I'll say, Mark, what makes startups successful? What makes great products successful? 
And the first time he said to me, you know what, I can think of two things. For You need the CEO, the founder, to have a vision. They need to be driven. They need to be you know, really wanting it in order to succeed. They also need to have domain knowledge. So you really need to know the area and the problem you're trying to solve really well. You need to know your competitors. You need to know your user base. So I thought, OK, that's where I can see UX is interesting. Whatever. And so a year later, and this is a guy whom I really don't see very much of, and I ask, OK, Mark, so he spent a year, now he's actually investing um, in companies. And, and so, Mark, what do you think? You know, what makes products successful? And at the end of it, he says, you know what? I think it's just luck. <laughs> <laughs> so today, I think that's only the main takeaway I want to say. If you've actually stopped to realize all this sort of stuff, it doesn't take a long time to do. It's really simple. You can do it with a pencil and a pen. But this sort of stuff you can do before you make a decision on what is it that you're building, before what it is that the first interface you sketch or the first line of code you write. Take the time to think. Be intentional about what you're building. And good luck. Thank you very much.